Hello, good afternoon, everybody. We will start uh, this uh, session on uh, next generation ECOL. ECOL has been uh, mentioned in uh, many other sessions, uh, so this uh, one is uh, really specifically on this topic. We have uh, heard that uh, current ECOL uh, has uh, faced uh, faces today uh, some uh, challenges. Uh, we have mentioned uh, uh, enormous amount of uh, false uh, ECOLs uh, that are uh, received today in the PSAPs, and uh, but also the the, the main challenge uh, now is. Um, technical, so uh, how uh, ECOL will, uh, will uh, be able to function after the 2G, 3G uh, shutdown, because as you know, it is based on an inbound modem. And this is why uh, NG ECOL, or it's also called IMS-based ECOL, has been uh, developed. And I have here three uh, experts uh, on, on the topic uh, with me. We have uh, Luca Bergonzi from uh, Beta 80. He will be the, the first speaker. We have also Olti uh, Gesso, who is uh, from Vodafone, that he will also uh, share with us uh, a very interesting presentation. And uh, Bastian Pintar, representing Etsy today, uh, that he will speak about uh, the Black Test event uh, on NG Ecol. So uh, please, uh, Luca, you can... Uh, Start thank you, thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. So today we're going to speak about uh, next generation e-call. Somebody might say, "Oh my God, next generation e-call! We just finished with e-call. It's already time for next generation." The answer is yes, because we want to keep you busy all the time. So it's already time for next generation. <laughs> Okay, so um, the presentation, of course, uh, runs around a little bit of the concept of NG112, but not necessarily completely. So, first of all, we all know that we are <clears throat> coming to a big uh, breakthrough. That the communication networks are switching over to uh, packet switch networks, Christina, as we learned that the EU community is calling it, um, uh, voice over IP communication, total communication, as they call it, and so on. And in this package, we also are going to get our famous e-call. Um, when talking about NG112, you probably have seen it already in other sessions or in the past uh, in our conferences. We are talking about an a specific architecture made of some certain standard components. Uh, that are uh, specifically uh, used to route um, voice over IP communications in general. So this is a picture taken from the internet, actually very simple, but uh, very well <coughs> designed. It shows like uh, all the potential services, legacy network uh, services, voice over LT, over the top OTT services are all part of, the, of this infrastructure. E-call is... Uh, coming through, let's say, mobile network operators in any case, so we could say uh, it's a voice over LT, potentially voice over LT service, NG call. Uh, how a, what, what's the main difference? So the main difference is that the design of NG call um, is supposed to be leaving aside a little bit the in-band uh, modulation of data to uh, embrace, let's say, the typical data um, structure of voice over IP communications. <clears throat> so this is an example of a SIP message where you see the classical data, so uh, the invite, uh, all the data related to the call, and the, in red, the part where the STP uh, negotiation will take place, so the, um, the standard, the, the, <clears throat> the codex, and so on. In the new SIP header, NG112 SIP header, a new part will appear, which is the embedded NG112 geolocation information. For those of you who didn't hear the news yet, NG112 calls are supposed to be natively geolocated. So we could probably leave behind all the various uh, workarounds that we've seen in these years. On top of that, on the bottom of the slide actually, <laughs> NGE call will introduce the MSD, or the data currently contained in the modulation uh, of the MST inside the same type of, of structure. So in the call, uh, um, uh, let's say, on the, on the, in the call protocol, in the call signaling protocol. Uh, eventually, the, 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 the final design would be to keep, anyway, the PER encoding as it is done right now. But let's 
forget about technicalities and let's go to important questions. So the first thing is, uh, do I need to have an ASINET to have my NG <coughs> e-call? Not necessarily. We call it NG call because it's, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, packet switched network, IP networks, and so on. But you don't necessarily, necessarily need to have an ASINET installed. However, the combination of the two, of course, uh, will give you the most advanced call, call management, call routing mechanisms that will be beneficial also to NG call. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, let's say examples directly taken from the, from the NG112 perspective. So we have advanced geolocation based call routing, the potential the possibility of geofencing routing, not based only on uh, you know, large uh, territorial decision making and so on and so on. Policy based call routing, deciding where calls or e calls in this case should go based on specific uh, behavior and procedures of PSAPs and so on. So, the combination of the two would allow those who manage NG call to benefit from all the things coming from NG112 architecture. The second question would be, do I need to throw away my current e-call modem? So the investment I made, is it already old? Again, the answer is no. You don't have to throw it away because there are several reasons for that. First of all, let's say <clears throat> most of the uh, modern equal modems are already comp compatible with the C protocol. And in general, probably with some small software updates or very little changes, they should be able to manage also NG calls. So you do not have to throw away completely your investment, replacing it as when you had a diesel car with an electric car. Now, we are talking about uh, small things, small changes. <clears throat> The second advantage is that equal modems will be anyway useful in a transitional period. It's not that overnight you're gonna change from current generation to next generation calls. So equal modems will still be there. They will be handling legacy network gateways, uh, legacy network e-calls, and so don't worry, for some time they will still do the job they're doing right now. Uh, but even in the case when you will be fully NG112 compliant, fully NG equal compliant, there may be cases when the new technology fails. So a fallback me mechanism has to be foreseen. That's why even NG calls may not have all the data uh, in their <coughs> uh, signaling as we've seen, we've seen before. In that case, a fallback mechanism on the in-band modulation is still, is still foreseen also for this technology. So your investment uh, should be safe. Let's <clears throat> now discuss and reconnect to the previous uh, session about TPS call because there is a chapter dedicated also to NG TPS call as a part of the discussion. Um, you probably know that uh, TPS call, uh, even if you were here in the previous session, uh, they have been struggling for uh, providing the services to PSAP for a long time. Uh, the approach of PSAP had been different from case to case, and one of the reasons was TPS providers are private companies. They have to provide data to a wide range of PSAPs around uh, a continent like Europe, which is made of different countries, different procedures, and so on. So uh, it's been, for them, let's say it's been a limitation for PSAPs, uh, it's been a limitation too. There could be opportunities with NG call. So what I'm showing you now is the application of a technical reality, which then, then will need to uh, cope a little bit with administration, laws, and regulations. But so let's keep in mind this is an example. It's an, in a hypothesis. Let's see if it's going to work. Let's see why it's important to understand uh, what are the advantages. So we have a. Uh, current worst case scenario. I'm not saying this is happening every day, but uh, it explains very well the situation. So we have, uh, now we have this French tourist uh, on an unspecified German car manufacturer brand <laughs> who is traveling to Italy. There is a car crash and he connects to his own uh, TPS service provider for help, which may be located some, somewhere in Germany. Now, how is the German TPSP supposed to reach the 112 PSAP of 
uh, uh, correct jurisdiction in Italy. Currently, this is a complicated task. It's possible, but like I was mentioning before, knocking at doors and so on and so on, it's, uh, it's a struggle for them. <clears throat> the, the difficulty here is that TPSPs may not be in the same location as where the incident is happening, not even in the same country. So how could this be fixed a little bit with uh, NGE call, NGTPS -E call? Again, subject to regulation. There is a disclaimer, you see, subject to regulation authorities and so on. I introduced here some elements which you may be familiar with, again, because we have been discussing them before, don't want to go into technicalities. So we suppose that we have a German ASNET and we have an Italian ASNET in our case. The scenario is the same. There is a car crash from a foreign tourist and they have to contact uh, <coughs> services through their TPS provider. The first part is the same. So there will be an NG TPS call in place with the inbound location. So the car will send its own location in different ways. But the most important thing is that we have source location. The TPSP, in this case, may be connected with the NG112 infrastructure in place. And by, let's say, providing a call with the location of the car, instead of uh, creating a call with their own source location, they would be able to use the ESINET capabilities to actually create uh, a call as if it was made by the car. The source location can be used by, from the original car location in order to route the call. The, the German ASNET will understand this is not a call generated in Germany, and by the routing logics that are implemented typically in NG networks, the call would be routed effectively to the correct destination ASNET, who will resolve the, um, the destination piece up of the correct jurisdiction of the call. This is not a workaround. This is a technological uh, application of you know, the data and the standards provided by NG112. So in principle, the idea is uh, we have the tools and we have the instruments to make sure that even this kind of service that today are complicated to manage will be much more easier. Now, the disclaimer is, of course, referring to this particular part. Um, today, it's not really a nice thing to spoof your location, right? So <laughs> we are now kind of creating a theory where the TPS provider may inject the location of another source into their own call. So that has to be decided whether or not it's possible, whether or not what are the limitations, how you can do it, and so on and so on. So in principle, it would solve, technically speaking, a situation, but maybe it will cre create other situations to be solved. That's why I'm saying <clears throat> the capabilities are there. We just need to see what, of, uh, you know, what, what are the chances, how to apply them, and so on and so on. So all the things I've said, of course, are not just created by me, besides the last slide, which, which is totally <laughs> a hypothesis. But I used some existing references. They are called NG equal, but uh, people are already working on the standards and defining how this uh, uh, should be working and so on. You may be familiar now with the first uh, ETS 103.479 document. Actually, you, you should know it by heart if you are into NG112. But uh, this is the main uh, uh, you know, document you, you should take in consideration when talking about this. And then for NG e call, <clears throat> there are two main documents of reference, the RFC uh, 8147 as well as the SEN TS-17184. That has been, by the way, the latest version has been released this January, so it's quite uh, updated, let's say. Uh, all right, so that's the final slide. If you have any questions. Thank you, Luca. We have uh, time for some questions. <clears throat> no questions. I have... Uh... Ah, yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> If uh, you can present yourself be before... Uh... Yes, indeed. So, hello, Luca. Antoine Trailleux, uh, representing the IMA group. Mm -hmm. So, we are both TPS provider and also Eco 112 uh, company in France. Um, thank you for this presentation. And indeed, it seems that the solutions are 
very easy <laughs> to find out. Uh, my question concerns the, the legacy car park. I mean, when the switch will be done from uh, circuit switch equal to packet switch for two IP protocols, uh, we could consider that uh, within three years we'll have something like 30 or 35 million vehicles, light vehicles equipped with an in-band modem system mm -hmm. already. And how do you see uh, the handling of these calls? What will be the behavior of the car in this situation? when the PSAPs on the side will switch to a packet switch equal reception. Yeah, so let's say there, there will be anyway a transitional period. No, there are places like, uh, I mean, there are countries that already have taken it in consideration. The transitional period will be uh, providing uh, traditionally call on packet switch networks. The transformation, let's say, will occur somewhere in the network before it reaches the PSAP. Uh, an example, um, North Macedonia, they completely renewed their national emergency network and they started from scratch with voice over IP communication, so all, all connected with seed trunks. In principle, this is not, um, potentially, you know, somebody would say, yeah, but how do they deal with e-calls? Because actually they do. And the thing is that they are using traditional uh, modulated e-calls on packet switch networks. At the moment, uh, it's still uh, absolutely feasible. Um, the, the, the real transition will be when uh, even e-calls will be generated on, on, let's say, packet switch network, voice over LTE and so on. And then in that case, uh, let's say, there won't be any obstacles anymore. So the current infrastructure, it's, it's a hybrid of the two things. But I don't see big impacts. I was skeptical myself at the beginning, but. Uh, we have seen cases, first of all, tests, pilots, and then um, si systems in production that easily manage the, the two worlds combined. Any other question? So, Luca, um, we are really concentrated on the fact that uh, 2G and 3G will shut down, mm -hmm. that of course this is the main driver for uh, NG e -call. but uh, there, there's also uh, an, uh, other uh, benefits of uh, NG e -call. So we saw the, um, the header, and to, it, today the MSD has a concrete uh, length. Mm -hmm. uh, does this uh, permit have uh, more data? In the, in the minimum set of data? Yeah, so let's say C protocol, I'm not a, you know, a worldwide expert, but C protocol anyway has been around for a long time and it was designed to <coughs> carry on a lot of data, not just the, the way signaling is transported. So potentially there, there is room for including uh, um, new data which are not composed by MSD. By the way, I just remind that MSD means minimum set of data, so why not expanding it to other information? A few years ago, we've been running the latest uh, EU-funded project, iHero, which introduced the topics of um, motorbike e-calls with particular sets of data for motorbikes, as well as uh, heavy vehicles buses, coaches, and so on, which necessarily need uh, more information than the, the classical car-based eco. So, uh, so far, this part has been kind of a theory, no? Uh, so, we have now the chances to make it uh, probably, uh, and make it complete as it was intended in the uh, pilot projects. Okay, thank you, and another You're thing? Welcome. So, Ah, yes, there's one question, sorry. Hello, I'm Miklos Sakac from Hungarian Disaster Management. I would like to ask a general question about e-calls. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some problems with, uh, with e-calls. Uh, we cannot really call back the vehicle. Uh, is there any technical possibilities to do that uh, now or in the future, perhaps? Uh, that's, that's interesting because uh, callback is part of the standard, so you should, you should be able to do that. <laughs> um, I don't know what are effectively the problems you are experimenting now. Um, we are talking now about something relatively different, but if you want, after the session, I can uh, you know, have a one-to-one -one discussion and see in detail what's the problem and see if I can give you some 
Tips. Okay. okay. Thank you. How are you doing? Um, Mick Fox from Comreg in Ireland. Um, referring to your previous answer uh, two questions ago about how um, calls are getting translated in the core network and many of them are packet switched in some form anyway. Are you implying that device, the, the devices in cars for some time now are actually 4G capable and there's a software switch uh, that we can software update in the future? or were you just referring to this translation deeper into the network? Uh, no, no, I was just referring to the translation in the network. So the, the let's say, end-to-end -end situation is that today the only way to uh, create an e-call is to do it on, 3G on 2G networks. So it's a regular GSM in-band uh, communication. Yep. Somewhere in the network that becomes a packet switch communication and the modem, uh, on the other hand, so on the PSAP side, is capable of receiving it and demodulating the call as if it was still on analog uh, <laughs> ways of communication. So, Just a quick follow-up then. Are you aware of any activity on the part of uh, car manufacturers to kind of quietly um, uh, enable the e-call for 4G modems, 4G access network, such that it will be software updatable later? Uh, uh, or would they be so quiet that we wouldn't know that? I have no idea right now. I just know that, you know, on the other hand, uh, uh, smartphone manufacturers are ready for that. That's, uh, but but I, I think uh, it, was, it was discussed yesterday with the session with Google and Apple and so on. So that's a good question because we are, you know, the, the e-call IVS devices are actually co to be considered as a sort of another call generator device, not just the smartphones and so on. There's still time for a question. Good afternoon. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, my name's Mark from Denso. Uh, I asked this question earlier in a different session, and I had the impression maybe it's, it's better pointed towards you guys. So um, my question was considering that around a million cars a month are sold with mandated 2G, 3G e-call, uh, and as the networks switch off their 2G, 3G services, uh, then that e-call system, which is regulated requirement in Europe, is not possible. So it's a general question, I don't know the latest status, but a general question for how is the regulation for next generation equal looking and what's the solution for the tens of millions of cars that were built with the, the recent 2G, 3G spec? Yeah, that's a good question. As a matter of fact, uh, from some uh, perspective, uh, it would be easier to you know, start saying how uh, NG Eco should behave from one day on than to explain how do we deal with the existing cars and whether or not this switching could be actually blocked everywhere because eco mandatorily have to be maintained uh, uh, until, I don't know, every car has been upgraded somehow. I mean, <laughs> it, it could be complicated, you know. There could be amendments maybe or something in the middle that says how to behave with that. But yeah, I don't have an answer. It's rather complicated on an administrative and legal level, yeah. Christina? Just, uh, we don't have uh, a lot of information. We only know that the European Commission is uh, working on a study on how to update uh, the legislation. But uh, for the moment, uh, we don't have any uh, final uh, results. And so, um, here, and on the standardization side, we also know that there are some um, work going on on hybrid uh, modes. So what's happened if uh, an in-band modem uh, makes an uh, e-call and 2G or 3G is uh, not available? And also, um, this also is uh, being uh, covered, covered, but uh, we, we don't know. We don't have a final answer to this uh, yet. I'm happy to cover part of it in my presentation. Hmm. 
Just uh, in the right moment. So thank you, Luca, for your <laughs> You're presentation. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Olti Jezo. It's difficult to pronounce, so better I do it myself. I'm a senior policy manager within Vodafone Group External Affairs, so you'd appreciate that my next 10 to 15 minutes are gonna zoom out a bit of the level of details that the colleagues have been discussing, and I wanna discuss this at a higher level, which I would appreciate you follow the story with me, and at the end of it, I'm very happy to answer questions, including the details to the best of my capabilities. Now, having said that, and maybe I should clarify this at the outset, I have no intention whatsoever to discuss emergency calling for Formula 3 cars, nor I have an intent to propose something to the authorities in this room. But stay with me, hopefully the metaphor will unfold itself as we go on through the next uh, points. Uh, these are the key points that I would like to cover with you today and the key takeaways that I want you to reflect on after we leave uh, this conversation. Uh, as I mentioned, I think it would be helpful if we try to elevate ourselves a bit from the level of detail and try to think 10,000 meters up above. Uh, and by that I mean Let's try to think what really is the problem, at least from a network perspective, that we consider in the conversation. Now, one would think, after having heard all these detailed conversation, that it simply boils down to product B, which is next generation e call. And there's a conversation to be had in there whether it's a next generation e call or e call over IMS, but we can take that afterwards. So, Product B being better than product A, which is the current call, and then if that is the case, how should we adopt it in the market and what needs to be done to introduce it? Now, I think if we go down that route, we miss the bigger problem in the conversation. And by focusing on a specific tree, we lose sight of the whole forest and the size of it. And I think this is the first problem that everyone should be thinking of. Europe inability to lead in harvesting the benefits of technological advancement for the benefit of those who need it most when it matters the most. And I think the second problem, which I'm not sure whether it has come up in the conversation, is Europe continues to disappoint vis-a-vis -vis the other regions uh, when it comes to anticipating and preparing for the digital and green uh, revolution. Now, why I say it is important to get the problem right? Because I think that informs the whole conversation afterwards. It informs what we set as a goal to address. It informs the actions that we take to address the problem, and it informs the pace and what we want to address first. Now, needless to, to go into the details of it, the colleagues might have addressed it and discussed it before, but everyone knows that the next generation call is just a door opener to so many opportunities. And if we manage to get that information transmitted via IP, it means that we can think of any type of added value to those emergency services, which currently we do not have. So basically, it's not, I think, the real problem or the stake that we need to address, e call over IMS, but something bigger, which can be achieved if we enable that uh, channel of communication. And then moving further down the slide, this is a telco industry specific objective, goal, or blue horizon, so to say, which is basically not only we can address anything that is in the space of emergency calling, be it in cars or 112, 
But at the same time, if we are given the possibility, we can go beyond by supporting other critical life use cases, which I appreciate might not be part of this conversation, but think of anything that goes in remote surgery, automated vehicles being run on their own, and so on and so forth. And not to mention the economic benefits that lies behind all these opportunities, which I'll get in a moment. Uh, I guess this is what the colleague was referring to earlier. This is what we call, well, there's a famous phrase which obviously I have not invented, which is a catch-2022. Uh, and basically, uh, between us and the car manufacturers, which we like to think of ourselves as key components in providing these services, we are being caught up in this catch-22 situation. And I think that the, the problem, if I try to simplify it, and I appreciate for those that already understand it, uh, bear with me for a moment, is that we have a critical need as network operators to upgrade and modernize our infrastructure in order to keep up with the increasing demand of the digital society. Therefore, we need to make the most of the existing spectral capacities that currently 2G is occupying, primarily in the low band spectrum. Now, at the same time, we have the car manufacturers that are being mandated by a specific type of regulation, and then eventually all the standards that come associated with it, to enroll in existing car as of April 2010, only uh, modems which are exclusively connected to the 2G uh, network. So, it's, it's the CAS 2022 is one of those situations, think of, think of the genesis of the egg and, and chicken, right? It's, unless you want to solve one, you can't get to the other, and then you enter a vicious loop, and so on and so forth. And I think from the perspective of the, and I need to, to, to correct uh, a bit the conversation in here, from the perspective of 2G sunset, it's not a 2G slash 3G sunset. Uh, as in Freddy's term, if he allows me, that ship has sailed. Uh, 3G has already been sunsetted in several markets, from several operators across Europe and beyond. So the real conversation now, which impacts uh, e-call, is 2G. And this is where the, what we call in, in the network terminology, this is the fallback network or the network of last resort. So if a call can't make it on 4G, then it drops down uh, to 3G and then ultimately goes down to 2G. So 2G is the real thing that, that creates all the problem, not the 3G. 3G is, is on its way out. Half of the countries have, have already gotten rid of it. Now, uh, how, how do we get there? So having mentioned 2G from our perspective, I'm happy to cover some of these details in the, in the question sessions, but I think they are self-explanatory. Uh, I did mention that uh, Europe, and by, by Europe I mean as a starting point, the European Commission has very ambitious digital decade targets, the 2030 digital decade targets, and in a post-COVID era, that means e-education, e-health, uh, 10 times uh, the, the size of information that you need to transmit per average or on a per consumer basis, and we need to cope with that. And needless to mention that by a certain point in time, all the suppliers, when it comes to security patches, software upgrades, won't be able to support legacy networks, such as the 2G that has been running for 25 years or more in that, in that space. Uh, needless to mention that I did speak about it earlier, that that specific uh, spectrum, which sits behind uh, 2G, primarily the 900 megahertz, is critical for the digital divide, and I can explain in a minute why I say that, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are lots of lots of reasons which push us so strongly to try to advance the conversation in, in this space. Now, these are a couple of numbers which might be of interest to you. Maybe you know, maybe you don't, but when we discuss uh, efficiency, 
from our perspective and the need to sunset 2G networks, it means that if we are allowed to, we can take that specific spectrum and use it 20 times more efficient for another technology when it comes to the capacity that is being used. If we compare the energy efficiency of that specific spectrum and you compare the energy efficiency of transmission per bit per network, it's 100 times more efficient if that specific spectrum would have been used for 4G, 5G rather than what is being currently used for 2G. And that 200 million euros per year is what it costs to us, both uh, operating cost and opportunity cost to keep uh, the spectrum uh, 900 uh, running for 2G beyond its natural uh, life cycle. Uh, this is a high level screenshot what it means for Europe if we are able to sunset 2G networks by their end of natural and economic life cycle. Uh, this is a, quite an insightful study that has been launched by the colleagues of the GSMA, so the Telecommunication Industry Associations, only a month or a month and a half ago. So I would highly recommend for those of you that have an interest to go and see the research and the data behind and how much Europe could benefit if we make it in time to, to release that spectrum and repurpose it for all sorts of customer public services, including next uh, generation call. Now, I think at the end of it, everyone will have a critical role to play in achieving that prize, that target. And maybe if I can cover a bit the details of it, of this slide, because I think this is the most important one and potentially covers some, maybe not all the questions in the room. Uh, starting by us, certainly we need to give guarantee and we need to meet the expectations that the society, but also you, every one of you has in terms of our performance starting from deploying uh, Volte across all Europe, having roaming uh, effective across all Europe with voice over LTE, enabling all the features and capabilities, the extra added layers in the software and the networks and the capacities when it comes to enabling those emergency calls in the network. And certainly the question that is being asked the most, which is, will you guys have coverage as you currently have with 2G by the time that you want to uh, sunset? Uh, well, I think a short answer to it would be yes. And there are two ways of looking at it. The first one is running through the numbers and business cases. The other one, which I'd prefer to take for the, for the sake of the time that I have, which is the common sense of it, basically being that if we sunset 2G, then 4G and 5G will become our primary network. So we have no other choice but to ensure coverage across all territories and perform as we currently do and possibly even better. The targets and the expectations keep increasing. And the other reason would be that any spectrum that we would repurpose and take away from 2G technology will eventually serve better 4G and 5G. So again, I think it's common sense to, to understand that the rationale behind is reasonable and we will aim to achieve those targets. Now, obviously we are not the only ones. We are the starting point. I think the European Commission as a starter has a critical role to play. And I say European Commission because it boils down to all the regulation and specs, the European Commission being the genesis of it. I think the first the first thing to address to, to try to solve that catch-2022 situation is for European Commission to take the first step and amend the call a regulatory framework. Uh, to go back to Christina's point, uh, we appreciate that the Commission has taken a bit of time in, in, in order to do that, but I think we are at the last steps of it when it comes to the regulatory review and the legal framework. We are in a quite positive space. So we have, well, the, the, the service value chain has identified what needs to be changed, how, and by when. I think 
the gripping point now is that the European Commission is just about to conclude a study in terms of how to handle the elephant in the room, which is the, size, the sheer size of those cars that have been produced with a mandatory uh, 2G call from 2018 until now. And there are plenty of solutions being uh, provided in the table. We can discuss some of them if we have time or interest. But I think it's in everyone's interest to leave no car unconnected when that uh, 2G uh, sunset uh, occurs and we will do the most across the industry uh, to achieve it. Uh, I think it's also important for the Commission in here, certainly to think of the funding. At the end of the day, everything boils down to having uh, support, financial support, to try to advance the conversation. And within it, there have been plenty of projects, like Hero one that was mentioned earlier, which covers, among others, also the aftermarket devices that can be one of the complementary solutions that can support uh, the 2G sunset as it is the case also with programmable modules, so the ones that you get uh, remote over the air, things that currently happen only, only in the TPS world, not with the existing 2G modules. Obviously, car manufacturers and the IVS providers behind them, supporting them with the installation, homologation, and, and then the rolling out of those uh, uh, modules, certainly they need to play their role, meaning that in our understanding they need to accelerate the work that they are currently doing in terms of uh, shortening the process of homologation, uh, testing uh, the, the 4G capable devices in anticipation to the regulatory changes so that no, there is no time lost across the continuum because we don't have much time to be honest. Uh, when it comes to authorities, governments and all the, the policy makers, I think Certainly, they are the ones that set the agenda. So they set the pace, they set the strategy. So I think it's critical for them to have a vision which is future-proof and take into consideration the big price that is at stake that I was just mentioning. And then for the authorities, I know you have been discussing this at length, but I think it's imperative that once we solve all the problems across the service value chain, that end of the continuum needs to function because there's no point in us investing, advancing, while the components, the hardware, the, the softwares and the infrastructure and the people at the end of it are not coping uh, with the advancement. Now, having said that, and maybe in retrospect to the, to the race car, I think that ultimately, all of us in this room, we want uh, to provide the citizens across Europe with the same peace of mind and comfort that that race driver has when it enters the car and goes with above 200 miles per hour speed. Peace of mind, which means that he has a group of colleagues watching behind him with the best science and technology that time can avail, we can avail, so he is sure that whatever happens, whenever it happens, he can make it. And I guess this is what I want to leave with you. If we aim for the bigger prize and try to address the bigger problem, I think we can achieve and give the whole citizens that peace of mind. Let's just not focus on one, one, three, but let's just think of the whole continuum and we're very happy to contribute, as the logo says, together we can. Thank you. Thank now, you. I'm happy to take any question or otherwise I'll sit. There's one question there. We are now having a problem with 2G to 4G. We are going to have the same problem with 4G to 7G. Why is the car not using the phone to call the smartphone of the driver? Uh, I'll give you my view of the world, but I think primarily this is a question for the technical and standardization bodies. Now, if you go to the details of it, uh, smartphones are obviously a, a fantastic solution, which is uh, portable, but they have not been tested and homologated to respond to an accident as that specific module has. Uh, that specific module that has been developed with 2G in mind, and 
it's, it's obvious the rationale behind it has taken 10 to 15 years to develop the, the testing, uh, the, the, the response uh, coming from the, the airbags and making sure that no bits are missed in you terms of... You don't have of to change that. It's just the making of the call that you have to change. No, I'm, I'm Because the telephone is going to be updated. If you look at the expected lifetime of my phone and you compare it to the expected lifetime of my car, then my phone, if there's no 2G network, I will buy another phone. I uh, won't buy another car. The e-call module itself, airbag connections and so on and so on, you don't have to change them. Just use Bluetooth to connect to the phone. I, I understand. My, my point being is that in order to introduce a new component in the whole ecosystem, that needs to go through rigorous testing and homologation to ensure that we guarantee the same safety standard as we have done for the existing components. But again, this is not a question that I think should be addressed by mobile network operators. I can guarantee you that the connectivity behind that device will be there irrespective of the technical specs that will be approved for the purpose of the emergency calling, be it them at a certain level at a certain point in time. Also, the point is if the smartphone will survive if the accident, to the accident, because this component of the car has been designed to be much more robust than a uh, mobile phone that we can it, have. It, it, it's not only that, and I appreciate we might not have time, but it's, it's a battery matter. Who has the obligation to keep the software updated? Who has the obligation to keep the, the battery updated? Who has the obligation to keep the, the, the phone running or the app running and so on and so forth? We enter a, a, a very long conversation, which I don't believe we have time. But thank, thank you. I think that that's a very important question. Thank you. I think uh, Bastian uh, turn has arrived. Thank you, all team. Okay. Remote control is over there. Uh -huh. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Bostian Pinter. Uh, I'm working for Synthesio, uh, but, and I'm also leader at ETSI, uh, TTF uh, Task Force of 017. Um, and I will try to present uh, the uh, ETSI plug test and uh, the previous uh, next generation equal plug test, uh, which happened uh, in 2022, um, last year in November. Uh, so, um, first, uh, what is the plug test uh, trademark program? Uh, it is a test event organized and run by Etsy uh, in collaboration with industrial partners. Uh, Etsy set the scope of the event and uh, Etsy provides the test infrastructure and test plan based on the standards. Uh, event uh, can be either uh, remotely or uh, on-site. Uh, events are open for vendors uh, of equipment and implementing specification uh, published by Etsy or other SDO. Events are open for governmental or non-commercial uh, or other organizations as observers, and uh, vendors uh, cannot be the observers. Uh, this is uh, the... Uh, uh, this is how uh, the plug test uh, event looks like. Uh, at the beginning, uh, here are some uh, event informations which uh, need to be uh, checked uh, and are uh, provided for the potential participants. And then uh, also Etsy prepares uh, the scheduling uh, uh, of uh, different uh, vendors and uh, participants. And uh, finally, at the plug test event, there is a lot of discussion and uh, testing, and uh, the final results are then uh, marked. So, what is the plug test uh, program opportunity? Uh, an opportunity for the Etsy standardization body is to validate and enhance the quality of their standards. Uh, an opportunity for the implementers is to validate their understanding of the standard, 
uh, and to test uh, with other real implementations and, of course, to debug their implementations. Uh, an opportunity for the community is, of course, to uh, promote the technology uh, and the ecosystem and to demonstrate end-to-end -end interoperability. Um, now, a few words about uh, second next generation equal plug test. Um, there were uh, one IVS uh, vendor with uh, two uh, IVS equipments, uh, and uh, there were three PSAP vendors, one uh, remote uh, PSAP vendor and uh, two uh, on-site uh, vendors, uh, and also test system vendor and uh, observers. Um, here is the uh, architecture of the plug test network. Um, Telecom Slovenia, a Slovenian operator, uh, prepared the network, uh, packet switch network and circuit switch network. Um, and then uh, in the plug test room, uh, there were IVS or PSAP uh, vendors, uh, remote or uh, PSAP vendors, remote or on site. Um, and of, uh, the IVS uh, vendors uh, got USIM card from a uh, telecom operator uh, and uh, perform packets which uh, next generation, next generation equal towards the uh, PSAP. In case of fallback scenario, the call uh, was routed to the circuit switch network and then end up uh, at the public uh, safety uh, PSAP uh, center. Um, in the plug test room, we had also test vendors. Uh, they, prepare, they had their own USIM card, uh, and uh, they were able then to connect directly with uh, IVS equipments and uh, try to execute some conformance tests. Uh, for the plug, uh, second uh, next generation equal plug test uh, event, uh, we had several test, uh, specifications and standards. Um, of course, the, the base standards uh, from ITU, from Etsy, and from SEN uh, are mentioned here. And uh, at the, uh, the, the first two test specification standards are from Etsy and from SEN, uh, one with interoperability test uh, specification and another one conformance uh, test specification uh, with uh, uh, the tests related to the next generation e -call. Um, maybe a few words about the enhanced interoperability test specifications because it was uh, uh, created under the uh, testing task force uh, 017 at Etsy. Uh, actually, the um, test specification covers conventions, test bed architecture, test configurations, at, and test scenarios. And uh, one of test scenario is uh, here. It is a tabular form with a uh, unique identifier uh, of each test, for example, and then objective of the test, configuration, references to the base standards, applicability of uh, each uh, of IVS and PSAPs, and uh, then some pre-test uh, pre conditions, uh, test sequences uh, with stimulus and then checks and verifications. Uh, and finally, also some uh, notes are mentioned uh, and add it uh, to such tests. Uh, so, um, in general, this test specification uh, have around uh, 50 test uh, descriptions, uh, 50 tests, and uh, they are split it into five groups, five subgroups. Uh, basic tests, uh, and then advanced tests for PSAP and IVS, and only for PSAP and of only for IVS, and also uh, a couple of tests for third-party services. Um, uh, here are the results of the plug test. Uh, all results are stored in the plug test report on, in the link, on the link. Um, maybe just a quick overview of the overall results. Uh, during the plug test, uh, there were 74, approximately 74% of past tests and uh, approximately 26% of failed tests. Uh, there were 20% uh, percent of not applicable tests, and uh, all uh, tests which were running were 72. But it means that all tests were not run which were uh, 
prepared in the interoperability test specifications because we prepared some, uh, some selection before the uh, plug test. Uh, maybe a few uh, issues which were found during the event, uh, technical issues uh, detected and solved during the event. Uh, uh, we, we were facing with uh, VPN connections, with uh, equal flag uh, and with uh, first equal attempts and um, we solved those things uh, and there were also some technical issues detected and uh, not solved during the event. These are particularly related to the SIP protocol. Um, uh, some info and XML content was not transferred uh, correctly and uh, uh, some tail URI was not supported by some vendor. And uh, there was also uh, another thing with USIM card, which, was not, uh, which did not contain some test equal parameters. Um, and uh, there were some technical issues requiring clarification in the SIP-based standards, and we, we had some further discussions after the plug test. Um, standardization updates uh, were done also in the Etsy. Uh, interoperability test specifications where a new test was added and uh, also uh, some notes uh, were uh, added and uh, additional table was added uh, with distinct, uh, distinction because uh, we, uh, we prepared also uh, a twin tests, for example, one were really on, uh, for packet switch or circuit switch network availability, and another one when the circuit switch availability won't be any more uh, accessible, so only for packet switch uh, networks. Um, and there were also uh, some update proposed uh, related to the timers for the SEND, uh, this, uh, for the SEND base uh, specification. However, at the end, uh, the conclusions um, multiple technical issues have been detected during the in initial setup uh, session and uh, pre-testing uh, should be planned before the next uh, plug test event in order to verify that uh, the VPN or end-to-end -end connection works and that uh, uh, the, some basic next generation equal uh, call can be established. Uh, before the, the, the session, uh, before the plug test starts. Uh, some changes uh, in the test specifications have been uh, suggested and implemented during the event, uh, and uh, some changes uh, in SEN uh, standard have been also uh, suggested during the event. Uh, 20 of 49 tests uh, uh, passed uh, in at least of one session, and uh, multiple tests uh, from the interoperability test specifications were not able to be executed uh, or, uh, yeah, uh, for example, because of the roaming uh, limit uh, and some limited service conditions uh, and uh, with some tests with uh, packet switch only environment. So, uh, this was from my side everything and thank you for the Attention. Thank you, Bostian. Uh, we have time for one question. I have uh, one question uh, for you. Perhaps, well, I don't know if uh, it's possible, but uh, you have uh, explained another the uh, test um, you are also involved in, so uh, about uh, the interoperability of uh, different uh, uh, emergency communications. We have also heard about NG112 uh, plug tests. Do you know if there's some like a big umbrella uh, plug test to know if, I don't know, an NG equal will uh, uh, work well in a, and it's compatible with an NG112 uh, um, infrastructure. So let's say put all the plug tests that are uh, here and there together and uh, test if everything uh, is compatible. Yeah, this would be really great to have some, some infrastructure available. Of course, uh, we are a bit limited, uh, at least because of the next generation equal, because uh, 
the uh, IBS equipment really need to be on place uh, to, to be checked uh, and connected to the mobile network. Uh, but uh, yeah, this would be really great if, if there would be some possibility to, to make some common plug test uh, with uh, different uh, um, programs, uh, NG112 and next generation equal, and try to handle uh, all those tests together uh, and check the uh, compatibility of the equipment. This would be really the best, yeah. Hopefully that Etsy would uh, go also in this direction. Uh, but of course, yeah, it would be great to have a lot of participants uh, apply for such plug test. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we can uh, close now the, the session. Thank you. I have uh, to, uh, to give you some uh, information about what's going on next. Uh, well, we have now the coffee break in the exhibition area in both floors until uh, 4.30 p.m. And then uh, here in this room, uh, we will have the session on uh, providing more data to first responders, the new era of mission critical communications. In the Lean Heart Hall, we have uh, successes uh, of peace up communications. In the uh, Kosovo Hall, we will have a presentation on emergency communications handling around the world, the second part. And on the C Hall, we will have a, a presentation about the guidance to industry and member states on the scope of the delegated regulation. So thank you very much for attending this session and have a great coffee. <laughs>